Good afternoon. This is Jennifer Llewellyn, Nursery and Landscape Specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. And uh, this is a webinar that we have created on detecting, identifying and managing box tree moth by Lima perspectalis, which is a, a new pest in uh, Etobicoke in Ontario. And the intention of this webinar is that after you watch this webinar, you'll have um, kind of the skills and visual familiarity with the pest and its damage so that you would be able to go out and scout to see whether or not your facility or your property is indeed infested with box tree moth. So we'll just start off with an image of the adult moth. Box tree moth um, belongs to the Cramidae family, uh, also known as the snout moth, and you can see that just in front of its eyes, there's this kind of like a, a snout light look to the front of its head, and those are actually its uh, labial palps that are, are kind of modified into that snout like appearance. And they are actually in the same family as European corn borer, which is a, a pest that most people are familiar with, unfortunately. If you've ever eaten a, uh, an ear of corn and you found a larvae inside, chances are that European corn borer. Um, but that pest is actually relatively well managed in North America. And you'll see in this presentation that box tree moth can be managed as well. So the adult moth, um, you can see it's white and there's a really nice kind of bronzy brown uh, coloration to the margins of both the fore wings as well as the hind wings. And uh, it's very distinctive. There's not really any other moths that we have in Ontario that have that real look to them. Not a lot of lookalikes here. And you can see also that when they're at rest, they hold their wings in kind of a horizontal orientation a lot of the time although they can modify this. And largely they are nocturnal and uh, they're not very active during the day. They'll kind of rest and uh, it's really during the night time that they become more active. So the first sightings were in the fall of 2018. Uh, so this is actually a year ago from now. This is now August 2019. And we had three moth sightings that were reported on the iNaturalist website database. Um, the, the main area here being the area of Eglinton and Scarlet. And there was also a couple of nearby adult moth sightings. And we went out shortly after with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency looking to see if we could find an active, biologically active um, population. And we did find some early in star larvae. And so we knew, uh, we knew we had the beginnings of an infestation over quite late in the year. And uh, we had a really uh, cold and rainy fall in Southern Ontario last year. So it, was, it made um, monitoring and scouting for it a bit difficult. So we really clicked into high gear in the spring to actually scout for this pest and get a better understanding of its biology and also behavior here in Southern Ontario. So the host of box tree moss is predominantly boxwood, so buxus species, uh, which is in the Buxaceae family. So it pretty much just feeds on boxwood. It's a defoliator. The larval stage is a defoliator. And boxwood is uh, a really a beloved shrub, an evergreen shrub that we have here in, in the landscape and in, in gardens and traditional gardens as well as more formal gardens. And a lot of residents um, will use this in front of their homes as well because it's such a, a beautiful, beautiful plant. Um, they are not native to North America, the species that we grow here. So if we do have a, a pest on boxwood, then the risk to the environment is pretty much negligible since boxwood is not a plant that is naturalized in any wild areas and it's, it's not native to here. So it's not like box tree moth could uh, spread to plants in the wild since there are none. It is strictly a cultivated garden plant. And you can see uh, the image on the left with the beautiful green foliage of boxwood. We've got a lacewing larva, which, or lacewing adult actually, which uh, I just thought it was kind of interesting to show this picture. So the lacewing landed on the foliage when I was taking a picture 
and it went down into this head down orientation and you can see the way it holds its wings it actually was mimicking uh, boxwood leaf so it would blend in and, and if i was a predator you know hopefully i wouldn't eat it so that was kind of neat so uh, there's been uh, some questions around is it possible that other plants could potentially be fed on by box tree moths and there has been no conclusive research that would indicate that these other genera of plants would support box tree moth in any concerning way. So euonymus um, is a very common garden plant that, that we all use. Uh, we've got ilex, um, which is holly, and there's lots of different species. And then pachysandra, that plant in the, the lower bottom center, uh, we use traditionally as a ground cover. And, uh, and, and in fact, in Europe, uh, they recommend euonymus and ilex as an alternative for boxwood in unmanaged landscapes. However, if someone does find some scientific evidence that box tree moss could potentially um, infest these plants and cause damage on these plants, or these plants would support them in a meaningful way, please do contact me because we really want to control this pest. Um, and, and that is our, our main goal here. So in the very early spring, if we were out looking for box tree moth, this is the stage uh, traditionally that you would expect to find. So we would find an early instar larva and what's known as a hibernarium, which is essentially just sort of a, a webbed little tent that they'll build up against the leaf and then you'll find them just inside there in that webby little tent. So that's what we were scouting for in, in just this previous spring here in 2019. Now, lots of other insects and spiders, of course, use webbing um, to support their, their life cycle. So a good example of that are spiders. And spider eggs will, will make a little webby sack on boxwood foliage as well. So it's easy to misidentify. Um, you really need to tease open that webbing and look to find if there was a box tree moth larva, or in this case, we actually had spider eggs. So you would never find eggs of box tree moth inside webbing. The eggs are laid openly on the lower leaf surfaces. So if you're finding eggs, eggs in a webby material, it is not box tree moth, and most likely it's spiders. So inside that previous larval hibernarium, you can see this early instar larva, which is very, very tiny, um, based on the size of our fingers in this image, and uh, with a little black head. Just another picture here. So this is what the literature is saying in Europe, that they overwinter primarily as an early instar larva. So we were out looking for these. And this is just an example of a hibernarium that was used and, and kind of got left behind. Okay, just for, for reference, for visual reference there. So again, here's another young larva um, or early instar larva of box tree moth. So once we get milder days in, in mid-spring, and I mean that when I say mid-spring, I'm basing it on calendar days based on the fact that spring starts on around March 21st, 22nd. Uh, so we typically expect to see these guys early May really start to become active when we get some milder days. The larvae will warm up, they'll leave that little hibernarium, and they'll start feeding on the foliage. Now in spring in, uh, in Etobicoke here, this year we had a really cold, long, wet spring. So the hibernarium, the larvae stayed in the hibernarium for um, a few extra weeks. Now, again, it's, it's, uh, it can be a little bit difficult to detect the larval population of box tree moth. They really blend into their environment. They're, they're great mimics for, for the shrubs that they're on. You can tell that they evolved with, uh, with boxwood in their native habitat back in Asia. Um, so what we do is we'll, we'll look for foliage that looks like it's been fed upon. The real key is that the foliage has been webbed together. So we'll actually use our hands and, and kind of rake our fingers across the, the shrub and then kind of fold those branches open and where they start to cling together, where they would naturally just come apart when you're pulling apart the, the branches, where they do cling together, that's when we'll take a little closer look, tease that foliage and webbing apart and look for signs and symptoms of box tree moth. So here is the webby um, foliage webbed together here on the left-hand side. We pulled that apart and teased out at early instar 
box tree moth larva here on the right. So another great sign in addition to the webbing is frass, which is a really uh, polite term for insect uh, excrement or insect poop. And if it's still green, there is a good chance that you've got a, an active population of larvae that they're still there or that they were there just a few days ago or so. Because the frass will typically turn brown and off color once it's, it's desiccated. Fresh frass is nice and green. So here's an example. We've got fresh um, early instar larval feeding and that nice fresh frass. You can see a little bit of webbing. Um, and there is the box tree moth larva. And early instar larvae are really small. So they'll overwinter. They'll be like, you know, maybe three millimeters long or so. So pretty small. Uh, and then they'll gradually get bigger and bigger as they molt and develop into to larger instars and older instars. But the early instar larvae, as you can imagine, they're small, so they have small heads, and they have small mouth parts. So as they become active in the spring and start to feed on foliage, they actually can only eat a little bit at a time. They can't eat the whole leaf. They'll just eat one side of the epidermis, which could be the top or potentially the bottom of the leaf. And so you can see here, there's a leaf underside that has some early instar larval feeding. There's the top side of a leaf that has some just chewing off the top um, epidermis and maybe a little bit of the spongy mesophyll below there. And then there's another um, leaf that's got early instar larval damage. So that's very characteristic. We don't have other insects that cause that type of damage on, on boxwood. And then as the weeks and months go by, um, or perhaps after a winter, this is what that early instar larval feeding damage looks like as it's become desiccated, right? So you see these sort of leaves become these little kind of windows. And if you look closely, you'll be able to see that they were chewed upon by a little tiny mandolin. So on the left-hand side, we've got an image of a, a desiccated leaf, so a leaf that just has dried out, has nothing to do with uh, box tree moth. And on the right, there's a leaf that dried out, but you can see that there was early instar larval feeding damage um, you know, from weeks or, or months previous. And lots, lots of things can cause boxwood leaves to desiccate, to dry, and to die. Um, we get you know, some pretty crazy winters in, uh, in Etobicoke. Um, we get some really long drying winds as well. Uh, you know, we put boxwoods around homes where there could be a lot of afternoon sun. Quite often, people put them around their heating and ventilation cooling um, vent systems for, for the, the house so they get dried out that way. Um, and they really don't have a, a great salt tolerance either, so they can be sensitive to salt. So just because you see brown leaves, don't automatically assume that it's box tree moth because there's actually a lot more things that can cause brown foliage or desiccated foliage than box tree moth. So here's another photo a little bit closer up. So we see lots of webbing. We see fresh grass, right, because it's still green. And then you can actually see the head and uh, the beginning of the body there of a uh, box tree moth larva. Interestingly enough, box tree moth um, larvae, because of their food source, they become, they, they sort of um, bioaccumulate a lot of the toxins that they get from box, boxwood plants, and birds won't eat them. So we can't count on birds as being a biocontrol, unfortunately, for box tree moth, at least not so far that we've seen. And so again, if you're scouting a plant for box tree moth, pull those branches apart where they cling together with webbing, have a really good look inside there, and uh, you're going to be looking for signs and symptoms. You can see the webbing. You can see frass that's actually dried up. It's turned black. Um, pull it apart, and there's actually an active larvae inside that branch. And then this is just an image of uh, a box tree moth larva, late instar larva, uh, just up against the stem of boxwood. And you can just see how they really do blend into their environment. You really have to look hard. It's good that they have that black head. That makes it a little bit easier to find that black, shiny head capsule. So that's what this is distinctive to describe. A box tree moth larva, we've got a shiny black head capsule. Uh, we've got those black spots on the dorsal side on their, on their backs, black striping. 
and then a green body um, with striping underneath. And box tree moth larvae are a moth, so they belong to the Lepidoptera order. And Lepidopterans are typically, uh, we would be counting the prolegs to tell whether it was a Lepidopteran or not. And so what we've got on this image in the right-hand side, there's that black shiny head. And then you can see those three pairs of true legs. And those are the segmented legs that it will carry into adulthood. But when they're larvae, they've got that long abdomen, right? So they have to be able to hang on to a plant surface and be able to feed. So they have these just larval temporary legs called prolegs or pseudo legs. And you can see here what was the, the, uh, the rule is five or less pairs of prolegs behind those true legs and you have a lepidopteran. So we look here and we count and we see that there's actually five pairs. The rule is five or less. So yeah, this is a lepidopteran larvae. If it had six or more pairs of prolegs, then we would be looking at a, a sawfly, um, which belongs to the Hymenoptera group, the sawflies and, and uh, wasps and bees and that kind of group. So totally different. And we would manage them in a different way too. So late in star larval feeding, bigger head, bigger mandibles, bigger appetite, bigger bites, and they can consume an entire leaf. Quite often what we see is that they'll leave the margin of the leaf behind, um, and then that will become sort of dried up looking. So here is some relatively fresh, late instar larva box tree moth damage, and with only the leaf margin remaining behind. And then as that foliage dries and the weeks or the months go by, this is typically older late instar larval damage on boxwood from box tree moth. So very distinctive. Again, there's no other insect that I've ever seen that feeds like that on boxwood. So if you are seeing that, then chances are it was done by a box tree moth larva. Now, the only thing that I could really compare to that would be the pruning wounds from shearing um, or pruning, which a lot of boxwoods are pruned in, in this way, to maintain shape. Um, and so those pruning cuts could potentially catch your eye and, and make you think, oh, is that, you know, just that leaf margin that's left behind? But obviously, no. When you take a closer look, you can see it's just a pruning cut. And when the cut, the, uh, the leaf is actually cut, it's going to desiccate right at that point, right? And it doesn't, doesn't really go much further than that. And then we've got just another shot here of some old larval damage and some webbing that persists. And you can see both early in star larval feeding where just one side of the leaf is chewed upon and then older um, late in star larvae where you've got the leaf margin left behind. So once the, the, the leaves are damaged, they'll actually just become desiccated, but they will persist for a while, probably at least a year. Mm -hmm. We've jumped ahead for some reason. Okay, there we go. So, there we go. We've got a video of looking for larvae, so pulling those branches apart, looking for webbed branches together. And in this case, we actually can see the larva of box tree moth blending into the foliage really, really well. So the upper image here is uh, a larva, but it's actually a pre-pupal larva. So the lower image, the lower larva, sorry, not image, the lower larva there is a late in star, fully grown box tree moth larva. And then once they get ready to, to pupate, right, to pupate into adult moths, they'll stop feeding, they'll kind of just hang out, and what they do is kind of reorganize their tissues and they'll become shorter and a little bit more stouter to prepare for the pupil stage where they're going to develop wings, right, in a completely different body. Um, and so this is just an image to show you what a pre-pupil larva looks like compared to just a laden star larvae, right, on the bottom. So it's neat how they shorten up like that. On the left, we have that pre-pupil shorter, stouter larva. You can see that it's getting ready to pupate. And then on right, 
we have a, a freshly pupating kind of early pupil box tree moth that you know you can resembles um, is starting to resemble a pupil case for maybe some other insects that you've seen. So on the left we've got the early pupa, so something that is just pupated just uh, relatively recently um, or started to pupate, and then we have one a little bit more further along in the middle, and then on the right hand side, um, late development pupa, and you can see the wings, the black and white wings um, that that are uh, just under the pupil skin there, and it's just about ready. It's it's going to emerge out of there probably within the next 24 hours. So towards the end of June in the Topco this year, uh, about 50 or 60 percent of the larva had started the pupation process, and we were estimating adult emergence to take place um, in early July. And we did actually see that that first week of July. We had adult emergence and egg laying that was starting as well. There's probably, um, there is two generations of box tree moths, at least that we witnessed here in 2019. The literature says that there can be more, but we only did see two adult generations. And then just another shot here of a box tree moth pupa that would be webbed and hanging onto the foliage, and they'll just sort of hang inside of, of web leaves together. And then a shot here. We've got a nice video to show you of detecting box tree moth pupa in the foliage. And there's one right there. And he's still wiggling his abdomen around. Another shot of the box tree moth pupa. They really do blend in really, really well. And then they'll emerge as an adult that white moth with the, the bronzy brown margins to the wings, um, long antennae, there's that snout moth again, um, appearance to the, the front of the head, and they will sometimes have their wings kind of uh, down there at rest. We see this orientation probably a little bit more in the, when we do see them. And then they'll be out mating and laying their eggs. So again, two generations that were witnessed in Etobicoke this year. The literature says that they can fly up to 10 kilometers an hour. Um, we don't have any proof of that. We weren't able to uh, say yay or nay to that. Um, but we, uh, we did find some adults that were flying around in the Etobicoke neighborhood. Uh, the eggs are laid on the undersides of leaves and some of our scouts were able to detect some of these eggs, but they're pretty hard to see. You can imagine how small a box wood leaf is, and then looking for these tiny little eggs on the underside of them. They're laid in small clusters. Um, and then we found that the plant phenology indicator for egg laying and adult activity in that first generation was at the time that the Japanese tree lilacs were in mid-bloom, the Syringa reticulata. And then here we go. So this is first instar larvae that would have hatched from those first generation adults. And instead of going into a hibernarium, it was warm, it was summer, so they started to feed. So this is one feeding on the underside of a leaf, and you can just see them chewing on the one side with that little black head. And the second generation of larvae that we did see in the summer, um, we found that it wasn't as synchronous in terms of development as the first generation of larvae that we found um, in the, the first part of the spring or I guess the mid-spring. So we did find larvae that were of different sizes and different instars uh, and a little bit of overlapping stages in larvae for that reason, which could potentially lead to um, some overlapping stages that would be going into the fall, which is really interesting and I'm going to talk about that too. The so box tree moth in Europe, uh, there's a lot of cases where it's been left unmanaged, especially that when the populations can sort of rear up um, after a number of years, they can do lots of defoliation uh, when they are unchecked. And uh, they have some evidence that if there's no leaves left and there's still an active population of larvae, they could potentially chew the, the lower stems or the branches themselves. 
we in Toronto and in Etobicoke are seeing more kind of isolated damage. So I would say based on our results, less than 10% of the infestations that we found were actually moderate to severe. Most of them were of a, a low kind of intensity. So something like this, where you see small numbers of larvae feeding on just a portion of the boxwood plants, which makes them a better candidate for management. And then some of them were more moderate to severe, where we had larger numbers of, of larvae. Now we actually, um, we had a scouting and treatment program that the Industry Association partnered with, and we found really excellent management with uh, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. We used uh, BT Kursaki. Uh, the, the product name here is Dipel, and it was very efficacious in our, in our control program. There's some more images of, you can see the early instar larval damage on this particular boxwood hedge where there was quite a large infestation of larvae before the, that it was detected. And then um, the dipel was used and the larvae were pretty much wiped out. So here's an example to compare. This is winter desiccation on boxwood. And uh, we, had, we had some pretty cold temperatures in Etobicoke um, this past winter, we did see a lot of winter desiccation and uh, some freeze damage on boxwood as well as some other evergreens as well. So, and you can see there's no chewing damage on these when you do a little closer up onto the foliage. So when we were out scouting in the spring, um, this past spring in Etobicoke, we were scouting for the biological population, right? So we were scouting basically for those little tiny larvae in the hibernarium. Um, we did find lots of live larvae, but we found that there was a smaller percentage of caterpillars that were actually dead. So the literature says that the caterpillars, those early instar larvae, can survive winter down to 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, we didn't have days that were minus, sorry, minus 30 degrees Celsius, and I I don't know if we actually had any of those recorded days, but we did have larval winter mortality. So that put a smile on the scout spaces <laughs> when we did find that there was some larval mortality. Now, because of what I was saying, how there might be, um, you know, early instar larvae and late instar larvae kind of present at the same time in the summer, that potentially would mean that we would have pupae or late instar larvae that would go into the winter that they didn't get to complete their life cycle. And any time that we did find overwintering pupae, they were dead 100% of the time. So it seems like, at least in Etobicoke, um, based on this past winter, the only surviving stage was those early instar larvae. So again, dead pupae put a smile on our faces when we were out scouting this spring. So there is, there is some good news for box tree moth, for sure. Um, you know, this is, I've, I've been doing this job for 20 years now, and this is the first time that we've had a new pest find, and we already had, you know, management um, techniques, uh, biological insecticides that were efficacious, that we had access to. You know, we really were in a, a good position to be able to manage this new pest find. So box tree moth is actually relatively easy to manage, especially in a production nursery where you're out looking at your crops on a regular basis and uh, we're always doing integrated pest management. Um, if it was to get into a nursery, it would be a relatively easy moth larval pest to manage. And the nurseries that we do have uh, in Southern Ontario are actually quite a distance away from the positive finds in Etobicoke. And in the landscape, it is also relatively easy to manage with the commercial BTK products that I already mentioned. We use Dipel in 2019, um, and we also have some label expansions coming for products such as Bioprotex and uh, Zentari, which is a new BT uh, subspecies that's available in the North American market. So it's nice, you can rotate two subspecies together. So, if you're not familiar with it, Dipel or BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, it's, uh, it's bacteria. And so what happens is it's sprayed on the foliage 
So any moth larvae that's feeding on the foliage would then ingest the Bt bacteria. And what it does is it causes a chemical reaction in their gut. And it's very specific to moth larvae. It, it's not toxic to humans or to animals or anything like that. Um, so it's a biological insecticide. It's one of the safest things that we have registered today. And it's actually what the cities use to do aerial applications for gypsy moth larvae, which were actually going on in the same area too. So the larvae eat it. And within hours, because it hits their, their gut, and that's where this sort of chemical reaction takes place because their, their gut is so um, high in pH, and they sort of go, oh, I don't feel so good. And they stop feeding. And then within two or three days, they will actually die. And uh, that's pretty much it for the larvae. So it's very, very efficacious. So the real key to the Dipel insecticide application is going to be coverage. And if you can, if you can get it on the undersides of the leaves as well as the top sides, so they'll just make sure that, that they're all getting to, to feed on it. So it does work really well, and it's biological. So that's fantastic, first of all. We also have other larval, moth larval insecticides. Delta Guard is also effective on it. And another key piece here is that there's effective pheromone traps that are available. Um, so pheromones are, are chemical signals that insects produce to signal others in their species that, hey, it's time to mate, or hey, it's, it's, this is a dangerous situation, or they can sort of talk to each other that way. So this is a, a pheromone that, uh, that they would be producing uh, to attract mates. And so by using these, the synthetic version of this pheromone, we're attracting um, adult moths to sticky traps where they get stuck and they can't mate, they can't complete their life cycle. We're using it for monitoring purposes, but if you used a really high density of them, um, it might be something to help reduce the populations in the long run as well. And the industry uh, is working, the Landscape Ontario is working in very close partnership with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, um, the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Rural, sorry, Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, and also the municipality and city so that we can get out there and effectively monitor and and uh, control this pest. So here's an example. This is uh, a box tree moth educational event and outreach event that we did in early May. And uh, we had a, a huge citizen science engagement. So we had a lot of traps that we used for our own purposes. And then we set, um, we uh, gave out traps and we had quite a few traps that are placed actually all across Southern Ontario just to monitor for the adult stage of box tray moths and a high level in, of engagement. So we just used a, a simple milk carton trap with the box tree moth pheromone inside and a sticky kind of cardboard piece that they would get inside the trap and then uh, they would get stuck to it. So their wings would get stuck to it so they couldn't get back out to actually finish mating and laying their eggs. Um, and so far, all we're seeing is box tree moth in this Tobacco area, which is which is great, uh, which means that that's uh, something that's a lot more manageable than uh, if it was something that was widespread. The pheromone needs to be replaced. The pheromone lure inside the trap every five weeks. Right now we're in an, there, our second flight period or our second generation. And what we also found, like there's lots of different traps you could use this in. You don't necessarily have to use it in this milk carton trap. Um, we found that the entry on the side, uh, that the box tree moths preferred a bigger opening. So we just cut out this extra little piece on the sides of the trap and the box tree moths had an easier time getting inside. A very minor trap modification. You can also use wing traps, um, any kind of open sticky traps. And we had the, the pheromone inside there that was placed. And here's some adult box tree moths. Um, that met an unfortunate fate. Now, for whatever reason, even though they're in a totally different family, uh, the, we found in our milk carton traps, especially uh, male gypsy moth adults that were attracted. So it's interesting because the milk carton trap, the structure is, uh, has been typically used for years and years as a trap for gypsy moths, but you know, it would be a totally different pheromone. So that, that was kind of interesting. So people did report back that they were finding moths, but it's actually gypsy moths. 
So we did work very, very closely with industry and, and different levels of government. And we hired a box stream off uh, field technician. This is Maria Lena, who is a student at the University of Toronto doing Master of Forest Conservation. And she was coordinating the monitoring, uh, data collection. Uh, she did a lot of the outreach and help with our citizen science. Uh, she collected a lot of data on the pest biology, um, the phenology indicators, and she's doing a lit review and a, a thesis and some reports on this pest. So it's been fantastic to work with her, and we look forward to her continuing on with some great entomology-based research in the future. And then there's just some pictures of some of the scouts that uh, Landscape Ontario hired to do scouting. Um, we're out scouting hedges and interacting with homeowners. So it's, it's been pretty much just a residential uh, neighborhood kind of positive find for box tree moss. And the industry did sponsor the larval treatment that I was talking about earlier uh, with a really high level of engagement with the public, which was excellent and very successful. And if you're interested, you can go to www.inspection.gc ca forward slash pest you can see that report all sightings in the gray banner there and uh, there's id cards for box tree moth there's info sheets there's lots of pictures and good information there from the canadian food inspection agency inspection agency and uh yeah so i hope that this is something that is going to really help you feel like you've got some really good visual experience looking for box tree moth um, and looking for signs and symptoms and feeling confident that, you know, you do or you do not have an infestation, hopefully the latter. And if you do find positive signs of box tree moss, please do contact Landscape Ontario. And you can email Megan at mgreaves at landscapeontario.com. And there's also a box tree moss uh, landing page for um, for this pest at landscapeontario.com too. So please do uh, go ahead and search out this information and I hope you've enjoyed this webinar. Thanks very much for watching.